At this time, we're going to learn about what's, what to expect for 2015. What's the deal for deals for 2015? And Tom Goldblatt, many of you know, is going to be leading this panel discussion. And Tom is the founder and managing director of Ravinia Capital. Ravinia Capital is a special situations investment bank focusing on challenging middle market capital initiatives, specializing on sell-side advisory. Tom has worked in private equity for Monomai Capital and Finkston Partners. He was also a turnaround consultant at High Ridge Partners. He has over 15 years of operating experience, working in every role from CEO to salesman. He holds a law degree from the University of Chicago, MBA from Northwestern, and is both a CPA and certified turnaround professional. Tom was recently awarded the M&A Advisor Distress Deal Maker of the Year for the entire financial industry. It's my pleasure to introduce everybody to Tom Goldblatt. And Tom will introduce his panel as well. What's the deal with deals, Tom? Yeah. Thanks, Greg, and it's an honor to be here. Um, we seem to be uh, one man short, so uh, we'll do our best to make up for that. Um, so before uh, we get going, I want to introduce the panel. I'll let each of them introduce themselves and, and their positions, and then we'll get into our, uh, our presentation. So I'll start uh, to my left with, um, with Mike Sharkey. And Mike, do you want to introduce? My name is Mike Sharkey. I'm uh, president of MB Business Capital. Um, we've, we started up an asset-based lending group at Cole Taylor Bank about seven years ago and have grown it to about a billion and a half dollars in outstandings nationally. It's a national business. Um, I guess that's formally, before that I was at uh, LaSalle Business Credit for about 23 years at LaSalle Bank. I'm Brian Borstein. We may be one man short, but I'm certainly one short man. Uh, in, 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 uh, in, Actually, I'll stop with that joke. Uh, I am one of the three managing partners of Granite Creek Partners, which is a private equity investment firm. We're based in Chicago. Uh, we, we manage a fund. We do deals outside of the fund. We like to think that we are both an institutional investor as well as an entrepreneurial investor. Um, with that uh, wide berth, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of land that we um, carve out. We will do control equity, we'll do minority equity, we'll do mezzanine, we'll do senior debt. We'll do what we think is, gives us the best return. And concomitant with that flexibility, we're also in lots of different industries. So uh, in a broad basis, we're in manufacturing, distribution, retail, healthcare, uh, insurance, especially finance. We are absolutely masters of nothing. Um, so uh, I've been in private equity for pushing 30 years now in institutional settings, entrepreneurial settings, fund settings, and uh, uh, probably have the scars on my back to prove that out too. Okay, thanks uh, Mike and Brian. It's a pleasure to be on the panel with two friends as well as uh, colleagues. And I, you know, this is a tough panel, I, I think, because um, I know mo a lot of the people out there and, and just about any of you could step up here and, and uh, what's going on with the deal so it's a it's an extra challenge for us to add some extra insight but we uh, we've done our research and hopefully we're up to the task um, we'll start um, kind of dissecting where the lending market is and I'll start with with Mike and let you kind of kick that off it's an absolute chaos um, I can't I've been doing this 35 years and I don't think I've ever seen a lending market quite like this one uh, our, our statistics from our trade association for 14 aren't out yet, but I think I can give you a sense for where the middle market is from the MB capital perspective, which, you know, I think is a pretty good representative sample of what's going on around the country. We've got 11 offices. We've got 140 customers across 35 states. There's a pretty good diversification of industries. About half of our uh, customers are private equity owned. So I think that'll rep give you a fairly good representation. I'll talk a little bit about what happened, uh, what's going on in the market with the lenders right now, maybe at the end, you know, drop the kimono a little bit, talk a little bit about uh, some of our statistical data. But the, the, the market is very competitive, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, we had our national marketing meeting this week, and we, 
we kind of did an informal study of our competitors to just try and get a, a feel for what volumes were like last year. And in vir virtually across the board, uh, our competitors' volume was down fairly significantly. Uh, and I think that's because, the, and I'm sure you're all aware what asset-based lenders do, but we're really being squeezed uh, by the cash flow lenders, by the BDCs that have all popped up, uh, by the banks that have come. The banks are back in a big way uh, lending money. And, uh, you know, we'd kind of taken the path of least resistance in our inventory, in our industry over the last couple of, probably a couple of decades, certainly the last 10 years or so, into uh, uh, buyout lending, because buyouts, have, they have their own inherent risks, but traditionally you have pretty good capital behind the deals. Um, you, you don't have the uh, viability concerns you might have going into a turnaround situation, finance, financing companies that have a little bit of a checkered past or a lot of leverage to their balance sheets for other reasons other than the fact that they're going through a buyout. But what we've seen here consistently for the last, oh, two or three years is the multiples of EBITDA that the senior lenders are willing to lend um, going up and the minimum EBITDA levels on those companies going down. So whereas historically, you know, if you wanted to get a cash flow solution to your transaction, you had a much, much better chance getting one if the EBITDA of the company was uh, $10 million or more. And that's still, for, to a large extent, that's still the case. In fact, I think if you look at industry data, current industry data, you'll see that the, if it, once a company's EBITDA hits $10 million or over, you're looking at a 10 times multiple. So, um, I mean, 25 million or over, you're looking at a 10, 10 times multiple. But even in our space right now, I think we're seeing on the manufacturers and distributors in our middle market space, in that five to ten million dollar EBITDA space, the multiples are really in that five to six range. Now, keep in mind that the regulators, uh, right now, the regulators are taking a very hard look at HLTs. The FDIC has issued rules on it that they're going to be tracking. The OCC has issued rules that they're going to be tracking, and they're they, they're calling any buyout where the lever, senior debt leverage is three three times or more in HLT. Now you would think that'd be slowing down the banks, but I don't think it is. We had a deal last week, local deal here actually, where the EBITDA of the company was 11, 11 million dollars, and the senior debt got bid by two different banks at four and a half times. So that's a pretty that's a four and a half times plus uh, another turn of mess. So again, the FDIC and the OCC uh, rule is three times senior, four times total debt leverage, and this deal was getting bid, bid at five and a half. So I don't think it's slow, slowing thing down, things down too much. Well, Mike, um, is the, are the BDCs and alternative banks kind of stepping up because of that regulation? Like, well, yeah, I mean, there's 50 BDCs around the country now. You've got, plus you've got, you know, used to, like I was saying, it used to be that, that um, you needed $10 million of EBITDA to get a ser some serious interest in your deal from a cash flow lender. But now I saw someone here from, some, one of Joe's guys from TCF is here. Um, uh, Fifth Third's been do going, dipping down well below that. Uh, Enterprise Bank down in St. Louis. Texas Capital Bank regionally down there has been very aggressive on the multiples. So... Yeah, I mean, you've got the non you've got the non bank lenders that are just mixing it up pretty good too. So the the liquidity in the market is really high, and when you look at when you look at the frenzy in the market, if you will, of, of uh, banks and other finance sources chasing deals, it's, there are a combination of factors that are really causing that. For example, because of the the, the leverage that's out there and the the high multiples that are resulting from that. I, probably, I lost 25 of my customers last year because, they, you know, we have 120, 140 customers. We had 25 customers leave last year primarily because they were, they were looking at those high multiples and they decided to sell their businesses. And when they sold them, they either sold them at a real high multiple, which was tough to get to from an ABL perspective, or, the, or more, more commonly they sold to a strategic buyer 
who could kind of justify those high multiples because of the synergies that they could recognize from the transaction. So when you think about it that way, I'm down 25%. I'm, I'm going to be down 25% if I don't do a deal. I've got to, I've got to replace 25 deals before I can grow at all. So, and, so, and you know, and speaking of growth, um, I did a little analysis on my portfolio at the end of the year where I looked at what my customers were borrowing in January. <laughs> you know, customers that were still here at 1231, what they were borrowing in January and what they were borrowing at 1231, just to see if there was any growth in the market, if they were adding capacity, if they... Uh, if their sales were up, so they needed to care, finance some growth in their balance sheet. You know, for whatever reason, guess what? Down 3.6%. Companies just paying down debt. So I don't know about you guys, but did anybody have a budget to shrink by 24% last year? Um, it, it, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's it, and I'm sure we're not alone. By the way, I'm sure that that phenomenon is being experienced by a lot, by a lot of other lenders around the country. So, are, are um, the are you seeing the line utilization go back up, or it's been low since the based recession? on what I just told you, it went down three point six percent. The line utilization. Line utilizations. Well, I guess you know Mitch Feiger asked me that question last night actually because I was telling him the same story. And um, I suppose there could have been some, gr some growth in the utilization of the revolving lines if you analyze how much my term loans were repaid. But all in all, they repaid that, right? So um, I know we talked a lot about utilizations, but um, it was pretty disappointing. So I can't really, none of us, none of the lenders can really be counting on uh, growth in, in the economy for growth in their portfolios. And we're all under a lot of pressure for growth. That's one of the primary driving factors that the analysts are looking at with the banks is are, are they growing their portfolios? So, you know, ha having said all that, we managed to we managed to have a fair amount of growth last year, but we had we had to uh, we didn't spend quite as much time with our ACG friends because um, you know where we could really make our mark with our cost of funds. And our expertise in monitoring collateral and managing risk, we can do those tougher, not necessarily buyout, turnaround transactions where there's a story to the credit. But think about where that's driving the non-banks, the finance companies, your uh, first capitals of the world and those people. They're, having to, they're getting driven right up the risk curve, right? So they're either doing t earlier stage turnarounds or they're doing cash flow lending. And um, I think you'll see capital, uh, capital source was just acquired by someone who's probably going to take them further up that curve. So with all this risk that's taking place with the leverage multiples we're seeing and with, with people dri being driven up the risk curve, if we get some increase in interest, we were talking at lunchtime, I guess, he was talking a little bit about the effect of an increase in, in interest rates. If we see an increase in interest rates, I really think we're going to see a nice pop in the restructuring market. You know, kind of like what we saw in 2009 and 2010. So we're just going to kind of take what the market gives us until that happens. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we'll come back and kind of dive in a little bit further. But um, Brian, you want to kind of tell us what uh, is going on with the, um, you know, the acquisition market? I think, um, as Tom said at the beginning, I don't think there's anything overly enlightening that, that any one of us are going to say, so I'll share with you some of my observations. And certainly as I'm speaking to a group of, uh, that purportedly is brokers and the brokers and inter intermediaries, um, it should be a good year. I think people are busy. I mean, there's 100 people in this room, and I suspect that everybody will close a deal or two this year, which is a great thing. Um, however, uh, like we often see, history repeats itself, and, and while I'm not going to try and um, ascertain which year in the past uh, reflects what's going on now, uh, I think everybody in this room realizes, and, and as Mike was describing, that there is a resumption of certain uh, activities and thoughts and processes that are going on that uh, uh, will be deja vu all over again. And, what I might posit 
to any private equity investor is, should you really be doing these deals as a buyer right now? Certainly as a seller, it's a good time to be doing the deals, but as a buyer, as you do it. Again, as an intermediary, while I'm not trying to be callous and forget that in the long run, you need to work on good transactions that work for everybody, um, the good news is that, that the environment is good. Um, uh, the credit markets are strong, at least today. Money's available. Um, where there were a lot of sellers on the sideline, and I see particularly families that had uh, the ability to wait to uh, not sell, uh, they're coming out. Uh, at least my read or my interaction in, in the market is that families are typically coming out, but they're not necessarily selling to standalone private equity uh, investors. I see it more, and maybe it's because we've done a few of these. Um, our portfolio companies are buying from them. Uh, it probably is a function of management that we bring in ready-made management and, and can we do instead of in the M and A, where usually we're doing A, this is more of an M, even though we might be acquiring so we can bring them in. Uh, I did try to pull together some notes on uh, what I see as is uh, trends that the private equity industry is moving toward right now in Q1 of 2015. Admittedly, uh, as Mike was alluding to, exogenous variables like interest rate changes, and I don't know how exogenous that is, but who knows what else may come in from left field to uh, slow the markets down or queer the, the uh, overall activity. But at least today, as I, uh, as I said, um, I don't really see any really hot sectors. I don't see some areas that people are saying, I've got to get into and other people have closed these deals and the lemming factor gets them to go. I see, I see pretty much across the board uh, that deals are getting done in lots of different sectors. Um, and, and they'll happen both with cash flow lending and asset based lending. Um, I do, I do, I have always wondered over the last few years as we sit up here in Chicago, why is it that so many oil and gas or, or, or service businesses, I, I wonder as the price of oil goes down and there's a global dislocation going on, there's probably a dislocation going on in Texas and North Dakota and other places like that, will some sectors like that have a, have a slowdown? And if you are uh, if you are a, uh, um, uh, an investor who is looking for dislocation, you might be looking to invest into that area while people are running away. But if, I, if this group was sitting in Texas as a sector play, I think that there's probably going to be a lot of heartache and headache going on in the, in the, next, in the coming year. Um, if you look back over, say, four years ago, um, one of the areas that I realize that specifically this isn't what most people play in here, one of the areas that was tainted was real estate. And, uh, and people were running far away from real estate. There's been a tremendous uptick in the value of real estate, not only in, from, from commercial real estate, but everybody's homes. And so there's this wealth effect. Uh, what I see going on is a few things uh, as a result of that. One, um, leverage is easier to get because everybody yeah, from an asset-based standpoint, I can take a look at that. Two is when you underwrite that real estate, there's some certainty and the values have come up. Three is within portfolio companies, I must have gotten at least five calls from sale leaseback people trying to, you know, uh, uh, spinning the cap rate tail, saying that you can arbitrage right now in a pretty good way, which is good for liquidity. And the last is I've actually seen now some companies that have real estate as a large part of their business, while it's still an operating business, whether it's hotels or, uh, or, or mini warehouses or what, things like that, they've come, they've come back again because they can trade because of that real estate. In a similar but not directly related fashion, I also see some technology enhanced companies getting a lot, getting a lot of attention. Um, uh, and and, and I think a little of it may be return envy. Um, you know, we here in the Midwest, and even though that there's uh, some ecosystem for technology at 1871 and other places like that, it's not really a technology-based, it's kind of more of a follower. It's not like the 650 area code. 
but all of us see outrageous, as we would think from a cash flow standpoint, valuations becoming technology. And so I see a lot of people traveling down that curve using technology as the leader when there's really a pedestrian business behind it. We happen to have an investment in one of those, and so I, I'm in the middle of it, and it's going quite well that we're selling ourselves as a tech, it's not for sale, but we promote ourselves as a technology company. At the end of the day, it's a fundamentally, it's a services business. Well, I'll come back with the trends, but you know, I wanted to uh, you know, add, you know, maybe it's a little different than Brian said, but I think, you know, if you're looking at 2014 as far as m and I think, um, you know, there's all sorts of statistics. It's hard to know which to believe and which not. But, you know, just about everything uh, indicated it was an extremely robust year, uh, some indicating that, you know, in value the deals were up by 50%. Um, I do think, though, um, you, you know, it, you know, and what's that fueled by, I guess, first of all, is that there's no question that there's just an abundant amount of capital going into private equity funds. There's just a lot of cash on um, balance sheets of, uh, of companies, and the stock market is at pretty much a, at a high. Um, that's also driving up multiples. And then, as Mike talked about, the, uh, the lenders are certainly eager to put cash to work. Uh, all of this is, you know, driven by people kind of seeking yield um, but I think that kind of, you know, diving into the numbers, I think it's a little bit uh, misleading because I think it's really a, uh, a tale of two markets and I think it's, it's separating more than ever in that the, there's this big, large market which is extremely robust, can get extremely easy capital, has very high multiples, and then I think in the lower market, lower middle market, I think it's still not as robust. and. Uh, you know, some of the statistics you would see would show that at the lowest of the middle market, it was actually a, a flat year. Uh, you know, not a bad year, but pretty much flat and not as good as uh, pre-recession. So I think when you look at the numbers showing 50%, I think some of that also is uh, biased that there are certain large acquisitions like the Facebook buying WhatsApp for $19 billion and, and several of the inversion pharmaceutical deals that just kind of skew the uh, M&A market. So I think sometimes if you're uh, uh, an, an M&A professional maybe on the street doing smaller deals and you might be reading the headlines that it's just going gangbusters, I'm not quite sure that's uh, arrived at the, uh, the lower market or not. I'd be interested to see what, you know, the, the people focusing on that market are, are more seeing. But that's some of the uh, research we're seeing that it's really the market now is really a dichotomy. But, but can I just jump in real quickly? But even in the lower market, when you look at deals that are in the market or to look at today, they are different than they were three or four years ago. I'm sure Mike in particular can, can touch to this. So just to, but I, I would have told you three, four years ago, I was stepping over deal piles in my office of companies that are not startup venture companies, but they had little to no EBITDA. I mean, there were, there were, there were, there were dead soldiers all over that. Today, while they may not rise to the level that Mike was talking about needing 10 million or more, there's a lot of companies in the two to 10 million the EBITDA, uh, two to 10 EBITDA market that are viable companies, you can underwrite their revenues, you can underwrite next year. Uh, that's, that's a good change, that's a good positive change, so things are moving away from that. Uh, a few years ago that is uh, smaller businesses which do have a harder time getting debt capital or equity capital too, there's a lot less balance sheet fixes than there were. Um, uh, you know, companies doing okay. Uh, and, then, and then the last thing is if you're now trying to, if, if you're running, if you want to run towards what everyone's running away from, if you've got it, and this is Tom's purview, if you have a small turnaround deal and you have some operating skills and a little bit of money, you probably can name your terms because they're broken businesses likely. It's very hard to do it. Even those turnarounds are not balance sheets, so they're tough. But the, if, you, if you can find one that you like and you've got the uh, stomach for it, the fortitude and the money, 
it's a one person's negotiation and, and people are going. So I, I kind of see those, those trends yeah. in the smaller market. I would say though, when we do the more special situation deals and uh, what I've seen lately is you're right, you can get those smaller deals done, but I find the sm so small size with the distress deal is a bigger handicap than a large size in being distressed because you, you lose 95% of your financial buyers who uh, don't want to reach down into the the level of like below five million EBITDA. Yeah, so if you're in one man show or, or you're going to operate, sit in the seat, you have to pick up the litter. Like, no, I was going to say, you, <clears throat> based on our experience, if the company has a pulse right now, it can be sold. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, our workouts tend to be sales. I mean, the, the, the last four or five years, just about anything that, that just clearly was not going to make it. And there weren't that many of them, but there were enough to know that there's there's enough liquidity and enough enough buyers and like you said the expertise to turn them around that we're we're uh, we're seeing more sales than we are liquidation. Yeah, yeah. our last three you know competitors versus the buyer have been the liquidator in a sense and we've been able to pull them off but um, but that's because there's such a, an interest now but you got to you got to work hard and you got to show that there is some chance to have positive cash flow in the future. It's hard, it's hard to kill companies. I mean, you know, as is, 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 is hard as I've tried over the last X number of years, it's really hard to kill companies. So if there is good liquidity, a, you know, a, 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 vi a vibrant liquid market out there, and I agree with Mike that you can sell it. Well, why don't we go back uh, to Mike and tell us kind of your outlook for 2015 and maybe some trends that you're seeing in, in, the, in lending? I guess from, from our perspective, we, we're planning for more of the same. I think our, our, our backlog right now is stronger than it's been in a couple of years. Um, and, and many of those deals are, are buyouts. Um, if, you look at, if you look at our uh, origination statistics for the last five years, four, four out of the five years, we, we probably looked at, a, we probably proposed on somewhere between 105 and 110 deals, four out of those five years. So it isn't, from, for us, it isn't so much, um, it isn't so much as the, are the deals out there, it's the nature of the deals are a little different. What we're focusing on um, uh, is a little bit different. But I, I, I would hesitate to say we're gonna see uh, a big increase in business. I think your comment on the statistics is right. I think that the reason that the, the statistics look so robust is because there have been a lot of big deals, and that those big deals uh, tend, but those big deals tend to be strategic acquisitions. Uh, we've seen a lot of seller remorse on deals. I mean, as much as I, I said that our customers are selling out, and they are, um, we did see, I mean, if you think about it, if you think about why you're seeing this, uh, this barbell effect on the deals, I think it has something to do with the the entrepreneurs wondering what they're going to do with the money if they get it, mm -hmm. right? Because the, if you if the return and uh, if they can get a three percent three percent thirty basis point return on their cash, um, you know, I think a lot of them kind of wake up midstream and think, "Geez, what am I going to do with the proceeds?" Yeah, unfortunately, the remorse sometimes is right before the sale happens. <laughs> <laughs> seen that? Definitely seen that. What, what trends are you seeing, Brian, in the m and I don't know if I, I don't know if I can speak to trends. I can only speak to what we, what we had tried to do and what, uh, and what we were endeavoring to run down the road a few years and what, what changed as a result, I think, of uh, the markets. Um, we had uh, ingeniously come up with a strategy that we wanted to buy uh, fundamentally strong U.S. companies and then export uh, our products and services to faster growing, uh, faster growing uh, countries like Asia. And we had teamed up with some people in Asia and we executed very successfully on that. We still do. Our portfolio companies have grown and our, our, obviously our basic idea was if we can increase revenue and EBITDA, great. If at the end of the day we sell it with an international sales, maybe we can increase EBITDA multiples, and the companies are doing well. What we've seen, though, is as the rest of the world has slowed down or cooled off, 
uh, the viability or at least the wisdom of the strategy uh, in an, from an execution standpoint is slowed down a little. And, and where we were relying on, uh, on vibrant and healthier, faster growing markets than our own, China in particular, to, um, to increase revenue and sales and, 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 and EBITDA, we're, we're, less, we're, we're less confident that if we bought something here that should be brought over there, that necessarily the market's going to be attractive. So we're pivoting a little bit on that. If, if it's going great, uh, we'll still do it. We're pivoting on that. So what we're saying, so in one sense, I'm not trying to be nationalistic. We see a lot of uh, of U.S. localized deals. We we do a lot. We do a number. Of, we've done a number of deals in agribusiness, and why we try to find some agribusiness deals that are exportable around the country. Oftentimes, they have some regionality to it. So they've got some land. They've got. They've got some uh, niches. We see a lot more of those kinds of things going on. I think uh, four trends that I'm seeing in, in private equity. Are, one is that the average hold period keeps creeping up. So historically, where it might have been three years, four years, now it's up six years, seven years. So they're holding on a lot longer. Another thing is that a larger percentage of the acquisitions being made are add-ons or tuck-ins to portfolio companies they have rather than just uh, you know going after portfolios. And then a, a trend that uh, Brian first uh, pointed out a couple years ago, it, but it's continuing to exasperate, is there's more and more sales private equity fund to private equity fund, which used to be a, a rarity, and now it's 60% of the acquisitions uh, by private equity funds are by from another one, which kind of makes you uh, wonder, you know, what is that second fund or third fund going to add to it that the other one didn't? Because when private equity kind of started up, it, it made a lot of sense of bringing a capital into inefficient, illiquid markets and professionalizing the management and bringing capital. Um, but now that trick has been kind of played, and it seems that they're so hungry for product, they're just kind of buying from each other. But also globally, besides the fact that there was a point that one private equity firm would never buy another private equity firm's company, uh, while, the, while the multiples of debt are going up on a deal, so is the percentage of equity that's in a deal. Um, uh, in, in, in the middle market, uh, and the middle market being, say, the two to six or you know, the ten, you, know, you don't get those multiples, meaning that the, the expectations for sale prices are still high for the seller, so it has to get plugged with pure equity. And that's hard to do. It's hard to get the return that people are looking to get. In one sense, you look yourself in the mirror and you say, I've just traded off uh, return risk for principal, uh, principal risk for return risk, uh, and I'll figure it out later on and hope to God that there's a good liquidity market by the time the time's gone. But it's almost what's needed to get done. Uh, tremendous amounts of equity are going on. I mean, if you went back to the, the 80s, uh, a private equity firm would never put more than 10% of equity into a deal. Uh, now it's routinely 20 to 50%. And we can all do the math, particularly as Tom said, the duration goes on. You look at an IRR, it just doesn't work. Um, uh, or the expectations are coming down. So um, the whole industry has matured. The, uh, the, the days of a 35% IRR for a leveraged buyout, uh, like it was in the 80s and the, 90, in the early 90s, are gone. And now, across the portfolio, people have their, their, you know, the, private, the, the general partners are selling to the limited partners, and I think I can get you 25%. Uh, and when it all kind of sorts itself out with a longer hold period, you're getting high teens, low 20s at best. So the, the business has moved. Um, I think on the smaller deals, you can kind of supplement that equity requirement with some SBIC money, right? Because the SBICs have a fair, with the, with the leverage they can get, have a fairly low cost of funds where they can come in and kind of help fill that gap. Yep. Um, Mike, how is the uh, competitive landscape, you know, see, you know before you were at, with with LaSalle and it was kind of the market was, uh, a lot of it was LaSalle and American National and then it kind of fractured and do you see it kind of, how do you see it evolving now? You mean locally? Yeah. 
<laughs> well, yeah, if you go back before B of A came on the scene with the LaSalle acquisition, you really had American National and LaSalle that kind of dominated the scene. And, and even American National, you know, Jamie didn't want those smaller deals. So um, it's really uh, fractured. And it's fractured in such a way, it's actually very interesting, isn't it? Because you have Wintrust and you have First Midwest and Associated and, and MB and, and all these banks in the market that are, are similar in size and, and run by uh, groups that are very unlikely to, to uh, get together and combine them. So how long that will go on or can go on, given that there's large blocks of stock held in each of those institutions, it could go on for a while. And it, what it's doing is it's creating one of the most competitive banking environments in the country. But uh, you've really diversified out of Chicago with, the, with Cole Taylor, or the, um, your portfolio is Only, mostly uh, uh, national. Under 20% of my portfolio is in Illinois. Mm -hmm. So that helps the bank to diversify. The MB also has a large, several leasing companies that it, operate on a national business. They, they have a quite a few, they have quite an investment in, in several areas of, of national business to kind of help make up for that. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, so Brian, where do you, you know, think that the opportunities are going to be coming this next year? Where will you be looking for things to try to distinguish yourself? I don't have an answer for that, to tell you the truth, Tom. I, 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 think, I think in a rising environment, everybody can get deals done. And while it's always a challenge to find, and find finance and close the deal, those deals get done. Um, from, from our standpoint, we, we dogmatically eschew the competition. So we will, we, we, we will try to run where everybody else is running. So I don't know, and, and oftentimes that will be on a specific transaction. Uh, oftentimes it will be in sectors. We're not, as I alluded to before, we're, we're pretty across the board, so we're not really a sector investor. So we, we will try and look where other people are coming. We probably won't try to step into the vortex of really, really difficult turnarounds. Though from an intellectual standpoint, and I actually look at one today, it makes really good sense if you can get it because they probably will hand you the deal and go there. So we, 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 we you know, from what we're looking at, which is not necessarily I would call market, um, we, we will try to look where other people are and try to price, underwrite, and structure around what the risks are that people think. Uh, I think if, if, uh, if you have the mentality and funds cause this mentality at times that you need to close because you've got money, you've got to get it out and you're going to raise the next one, you will close deals and you may have some heartburn a few years from now. Um, I wanted to say a couple of words about the uh, distress market since we focus on the special situation. It's kind of interesting um, that that market, I think contrary to what a lot of people would think, um, but it's it, it, where people, uh, bankruptcy attorneys, turnaround consultants, uh, workout bankers as well, where um, you know they were pretty busy 2009, somewhat 10. It started to slow down in 11, get slower in 12, and people would say that it's you know going to pick up. And I think it's gone to even a, a lower level. So if you see the uh, you know turnaround consultants, they're, they're kind of reinventing themselves right now, and uh, I think that the. The issue right now is that um, it really comes from the lending. Is that nobody, when they get into uh, distress, uh, you know, really wants to hire a turnaround consultant. Nobody wants to sell in the distress situation. It wasn't their dream, uh, you know, to get into distress and sell. It has to be kind of pushed upon them. And I think what's happening right now is normally it's the uh, the banks uh, when somebody gets into a problem with their loan that are going to say to them you need to hire one of these three guys or you need to take action or we're going to take action. And that's just not really happening right now um, because there's just other lenders coming in that are alternative lenders in a lot of cases that are willing to refinance what looks even to be unrefinanceable. Um, the question is, uh, you know, when's that going to turn? And I think with, like, as we've discussed, the multiples being higher and the leverage rates being higher, 
that um, at some point it's going to have to turn. It's just a cyclical type of thing, but it's just amazing how low it's gone at this point. Uh, it's somewhat counterintuitive. Uh, it seems to me, though, I wouldn't want to uh, prompt MB or, or, or anyone like that to get into this mindset of lending. Being uh, a, a loan-to-own uh, investor at this point, at the, at the, even at the bottom of the mezzanine or, or that turn, you, you, could be, you could be in a pretty good shape in the next few years if you so chose to act on, that, on, on defaults and things like that. It's always the banks. <laughs> the banks you know be safe. We, we, I, I believe in bringing in the, the consultants. When, I, when if, I listen, if I see the company struggling and I meet with management and the owner tells me how he's going to fix it and I give him a chance to and it's still not I don't hesitate to try and get him some help. I think what we're seeing, though, is that there are other tranches of debt in our deals and there's private equity in a lot of our deals. And... They either bring in their own guy, or they just keep putting money in trying to fix it. We have a lot of deals where the, it's the Mez and the equity guys just keep putting in money, trying to get it very, very patient, trying to get it turned around. And I don't know if that's because it's so hard to find anything else to put their money into, or it's they're in denial about the original de investment decision they made. But... Um, I mean, it's almost beyond reason at times that, that how much money is going into these deals. Well, I, I do think part of it is, is, is to the point, is the, the um, bankruptcy is not a business plan or, you know, coming out of the box. And if, if, every, if, a, if a private equity portfolio manager was to maximize uh, his time and his money, um, you really wouldn't spend a lot of time on the nines and tens. But you do because they're fun. Uh, and if you had a one or a two, you probably should just uh, face the music and pull the plug. But you don't because you're hoping maybe you can. And to Don's point, smaller businesses are, sk are skating along the uh, along the uh, pavement, and you know, a little, you know, just a one little downturn and you hit it. But you spend a lot of time, and that's emotionally, financially, and physically very, very tiring. And that, but when you, if you took your three, fours, and fives and made them five, sixes, and sevens, your portfolio would do really, really well. Your tens would do, your nines and tens would do well. You move them up, you walk away from them there. But I think it's at least human nature, uh, particularly in a leveraged buyout situation, you've got a partnership. If we do a deal, we have a partnership with manager, we're going to make it happen, they're going to make it happen. We bring an MB, say, as, as a lender. You know, that's our partner. We're going to make it happen. We have our commitment. So we want them to think that we're going to exhaust every every uh, every um, trick in the book we have, which might be more money. We want them to think we're a good sponsor. We're going to keep doing it. So it's rational to a degree, even though you could argue if we're heartless and, and, uh, and short-term thinking, we would just hike up our skirts and run. Um, Mike, can you give us a little insight? Um, you know, mer most mergers and acquisitions, it's very difficult to do the integration, and often there's different cultures that make it challenging. So how is the merger working from the inside, MB and Cole Taylor? Oh, the MB, Cole Taylor. Uh, you know, I think MB has done this a lot, and um, they had a process that was very well thought out and tried and true. And one thing they did, um, Scott the Kuiper's in the room here, he, he'll know what I'm talking about. We, um, we put all the lenders from the entire bank on two floors for six months so that they could help each other solve problems, know, you know, where do I get this, how do I, how do I you know, how, just all the little technical things you don't think about. And they helped each other for six months, and I think, and they had meetings, they had, they had, uh, uh, Mitch has a Monday morning call with the whole bank every Monday morning for uh, about 15 minutes just to get everyone started on their week. The entire employee base listens to. They were getting together for those calls and having a cup of coffee. And, um, I mean, it, mergers are never easy, and there are always difficult decisions that need to be made, and there are always a lot, there's always a lot of frustration because something doesn't work or you don't know how to use something or the system's different, things are different, but you get through it. I mean, it's, we're pretty much through it, actually. And it didn't hurt that 
this, the uh, Fed took 13 months to approve the deal, so we had 13 months to practice before we actually uh, we actually put the banks together. And the slogan of the bank is now at you know, tu say, As long as you're allowing me to speak on this subject, I, w I would say that the, the really interesting thing about this merger was that we were the largest bank, Cole Taylor was the largest bank of its size in the United States with only nine branches. And MB had almost 100 and had a huge retail presence. So when you when you put the two banks together, I think between them there were, let's say there were a thousand, I'm just picking a number out of the air, let's say there were a thousand commercial customers. There were less than 25 customers in common. That's how perfectly the banks mer matched each other's capabilities. They had stronger capital markets, strong, obviously stronger cash management. So. Um, there was really, it was pretty darn painless because you did, you needed all the commercial lenders. There was no overlap in the commercial uh, loan base. There was, there was no overlap in the asset base, for example. We built a, a billion and a half dollar company at Cole Taylor and we, there were two or three guys we, that had used to work for us at Cole Taylor who had a nice little portfolio and we merged it in. But from that standpoint, at the officer level, it was virtually painless. So that's my um, Brian. On that. Um, one time when we were um, up for a deal versus a large bank, like you know some of the like Duff and Phelps and Lincoln, you know, and we were competing, and the, uh, the the people said, "Well, we're not comfortable how the private equity is going to receive the deal." Uh, you know, if you, you have a boutique versus these national brands, and you were able to help uh, overcome that gap by saying, you know, talking about how when you receive a deal. You know, um, you know the investment bank. What what insight can you give to some of the intermediaries to help them? You know, maybe in the pitches. You know, uh, you know, as you review a deal, like you know that if you see a, an, an excellent boutique, you know what it means to you versus a, a like a large uh, investment bank. So how? Let me make sure I know what you're referring to. But uh, are, are you talking about how is it can? Uh, the uh, boutique intermediary, intermediary to differentiate yeah, him or herself be from and be a better choice. Um, well, one answer is if I'm buying dropping price. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, I think it starts, and in, 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 in what Tom's referring to is that he had asked me to be a reference for him to somebody else, and he was going up against a, lar a larger, a larger firm, and and. Uh, Without waxing eloquence on time, which I could do at any time, at the end of the day, what it was, was, it was the difference of actually getting very, very deep and dirty into the company and, 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 and knowing the business, knowing the numbers. We all know as financial people that numbers can tell part of the story of the business, but also knowing the business from an operating standpoint. And what I had, uh, what I had highlighted to them is that you're not just getting uh, a, uh, a, a financial turnstile with Tom. You're getting someone who will have gone in before, um, scrubbed the company, cleaned out part of the company, uh, and then, and then he tried to as best eliminate what would have been the uh, most difficult parts, as anybody knows in a sale, is um, missed earnings, uh, blind spots, uh, all of the uh, all of the um, private ad back stuff that uh, that nobody really wants to see. So he really went in there, scrubbed it, cleaned it, and was truly more val more value add. And I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it, it's harder to do. But the work up front of setting the table before bringing the meal uh, and making sure that if that means you have to go back and help the chef. Uh, uh, I, I think that that's that, that's the difference, and the buyers know it. I mean, the buyer, you know, when 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 we will sit across the table from business brokers or intermediaries, and all they're doing is giving platitudes. Not only do your eyes roll back in your head, but you kind of get the moniker of a platitude kind of person. But when you're in there with some true knowledge, you don't have to be an industry expert. True knowledge of the business. And steering, and steering the buyer to the conclusions that you need the buyer to have and having made sure that it's as pristine because you did work in advance, 
we'll rehire those people even if we're on the side of the table because you know that, that at the end of the day, we all know you're in the trough and slugging it out until you really get it done. Uh, thank, I was trying to give the insight, not an ad, but I appreciate yeah, it. Right. did great. Yeah. Um, how about let's open it up for questions. Um, if anybody has any questions for uh, any of us. Well, yep. So, you know, when right. you do the math on first leave of thought for senior and meds and then uh, you look at the, you know, generally speaking, graphs and information on, uh, you know, relatively the amount of capital at, at the front end of the deal is equity capital. It, it just always seems like the overall number that you come up with falls short to get the deal done. So, uh, am I missing something here or... Uh, At what stage, though? I mean, if the deal gets done, obviously it didn't get them short, right? Right, and that's what, that's what I'm sort of asking, right. is, is given the multiples that you're hearing, and, and, and then are you hearing multiples that maybe aren't, aren't in sync necessarily? Yeah. You could text. He's basically, what I think what he's saying is, um, everybody hears about the deal, and someone says, oh my God, it went at seven times. Yeah, but you can't really pencil out with the number of turns in the equity for work and what was really the what was really the multiple it closed at. Yeah, Mike, so you could probably type. Mike could probably type this more than, than we can. It's always a mystery to me. See, I told you. I had a uh, I had an oil services company. They were they were a fracker. <laughs> they had one rig, had one rig set. They were. Um, um, I don't remember exactly what their EBITDA was, but we went in and financed their working capital, and GE Capital bought them another rig. And they were operating with two rigs for six months after that. My revolving loan was $3 million, and they just sold the company for $100 million. I have no idea how they got to that number, actually. And, and they, the, the, the price was agreed before the downturn, and it didn't change that much after. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I believe that everybody up and down the capital stack are smart people and certainly incentivized to make sure that they're not really doing stupid deals. So I think that what is probably less obvious is what really was the final EBITDA, right? So you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, I do think, though, in this environment, there is a tremendous tremendous amount of debt and I think that is um, uh, more uh, vexing and scary is the amount of mezzanine that's coming in. Senior debt even on a cash flow basis is probably pretty good and if you did a stretch senior debt and close the deal with no mezzanine it, you could have problems but you're certainly less problems than you will if you're down plugging the gap. I've you, you know, you could have mezzanine that is truly cheap equity, but if you have mezzanine that is another turn of debt, you're going to be potentially restructuring that company. I, I think it's amazing, Art, taking your quite You know, I was talking to, uh, there's some students from University of Chicago and a professor from private equity, and the, the interesting thing is in those classes, it's very sophisticated, the valuations, and then you get in a private equity and we're talking about multiple, of, you know, like on a napkin, like it's always times six, it's a seven times. And, it, and it's such a simplification because there's so many other things that go into it and it doesn't take into account whether there's, you know, uh, capital expenditures or the working capital adjustments and what type of pre-adjustments, you know, and it's really, we, we get away from the sophisticated math of what is really the uh, the present value of the stream of cash flows. Nobody does that. They just say, I got it for seven. Yeah, but multiple is just the inverse of the of the discount of the interest rate discount cash flow. We we, we may not run uh, option pricing models on these things, but you know, and, and 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 the other thing is, and I've said this before, but e, but e, EBITDA and a multiple EBITDA really should start and end with what can you support in terms of debt? Uh, because after you own an EBITDA, while people judge bonuses, they judge uh, valuation, whole thing, it really comes down to cash flow. Uh, and and you know, we, we spend a lot of time, you know, six to nine months of closing a deal 
talk about the multiple of EBITDA to the point to get to closing. After that, um, from a from a day to day, month to month, pay the bill standpoint, it's cash flow. Uh, I think they're coming. I think they're, the recaps. To me, recaps are really um, they're they're almost the easiest thing to do, right? Because you all you have to do is look at historical data and the resulting cap structure when you get done to know if the deal is going to work or not. I think the question is when's when's the party going to start? And uh, I think it's just going to take some increase in in rates. Did that answer, did that answer your question? Well, I want to thank uh, panelists, and I want to thank you guys. I'd be certainly, uh, hopefully we uh, give you some insights, but I'm sure you guys all have insights, and I'd be glad to uh, learn from you as we have the cocktails. Thank you. Thank you.